uh, Joe, we were talking about um, Shalom Aleichem's uh, granddaughter. What did mm. she tell you that you didn't already know or that surprised you? You know, I'd, um, that's a good question. I don't know if it was a particular thing, but she was able to paint a portrait of him in a very intimate way that only a family member can. And um, she talks about things like his vanity, the fact that here was this guy, and he was a very generous man and, um, and a very humane guy, but how he would pluck the gray hairs out of his beards. He was a bit of a dandy. She talked about his gambling uh, on the stock market. Um, and she talked about little family pranks. This actually didn't make it into the film, but I think it's actually on YouTube. But he would do funny things like when there was a party, people over at a party and they'd taken off their shoes, he would go outside and mix up people's shoes. <laughs> and he was a little prankster. So it was that, it was that you know, it's that wonderful look at a great man, the, the, the interesting, intimate side of a great man. I thought that, yeah, I remember when she talked about plucking the uh, gray hairs from his beard and that, that that always bothered him. And the stuff that you have in there about him um, um, playing the stock market, that's just, I mean, part of me, I was very surprised by it, but part of me also, uh, having known a lot of old uh, Yiddish uh, men right. over the years, uh, it did not surprise me. Yeah. Well, you know, he was an interesting character. He was a terrible, terrible businessman. Mm. And um, I think a lot of that comes from the fact, I mean, what's interesting in part about Shalom Aleichem is he comes from a generation, he's very different from the, the, the men and women he was actually documenting in his stories or writing about in his stories. He was an assimilated Russian Jew in mm -hmm. the same way that we're assimilated American Jews. And um, he lived in a large city, Kiev, for much of his life. And he had the luck of, of inheriting this money from his father-in-law, who was a wealthy man. And the idea of being able to play the stock exchange, of being able to all of a sudden have this money and perhaps make more money with it, I think was just something that he, he couldn't pass up. And what's interesting, of course, was that at the same time he was doing this, of course, in the evenings... Uh, late into the evenings, he was writing his, his Yiddish stories, and a lot of the reason he was playing the stock exchange was probably, in fact, not just to support himself, but really to support his Yiddish writing habit, hmm. because he was taking that money and he was creating the first um, Yiddish literary annual, which was modeled after Russian uh, literary annuals, which was a mark of, of high literature. So he really was oh, had a had a goal with that money. It wasn't simply to, to become uh, even more wealthy himself. It was really to use that for something that he cared about more than anything else in the world, and that was the creation of a real modern uh, Yiddish literature. Hmm. Now, in his day, how did most people come to know his stories? It wasn't through books. It wasn't at all, and in fact, the fact that after he lost his fortune, he was unable to, to put out this literary annual was in some ways a saving grace for him, even though it destroyed him financially. Mm. I mean, he had already been publishing in what was then the, the, the young Yiddish press, uh, <clears throat> which was growing over time. I mean, there was problems of Russian censorship, so there were only so many papers, etc., etc., but uh, the way most writers at that point reach their audience, and this was true not just of Yiddish writers, it's how Charles Dickens, other 19th century writers reached their audience, it was through newspapers or magazines, it was weekly, and he came to most readers in the weekly, uh, the weekly art supplement of the Yiddish paper on Friday nights. Hmm. Well, let's, um, let's change gears a little bit before, while we still have a few minutes. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the making of a documentary, of course this one in particular. Um, documentary is not known necessarily as a way, speaking of getting rich, not necessarily known as a way to get rich. Um, and I'm thinking that making one that will be certainly at the beginning, it primarily shown at uh, Jewish film festivals, kind of narrows the audience a little further. Uh, or maybe I'm mistaken about all this? Uh, I hope you are. <laughs> I hope you are. There is, there has been, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're opening it really basically the best art house in New York, Lincoln Plaza Cinemas, and then, as I say, have plans to expand. I, I think that 
and this is no secret to anyone who's been around the last 15 or 20 years, <clears throat> documentaries in many ways have gained a larger and larger theatrical audience. Mm -hmm. And um, it's certainly not, uh, not going to make anyone wealthy. Uh, it's not like uh, gambling on the stock exchange, although there's a certain amount of gambling involved. I'm self-distributing this rather than going with a traditional distributor. But I really hope to find uh, a, a strong theater-going audience. Other films have, have shown that that's possible in the past. And I know, I think that this audience is probably primarily Jewish, but I'm hoping to reach out beyond the Jewish audience because Fiddler on the Roof is such a universal uh, work of art. And the stories it's based on, the Tevi stories it's based on, are, are equally universal. And, and I'm hoping lots of people come out to the theater. Mm. I mean, I, obviously, I'm, I'm thinking you, you play this well in New York, in uh, Toronto, in Chicago, uh, Los Angeles. Philadelphia, um, Boston, right. San Francisco. Miami. But I'm thinking that uh, in Des Moines, it might not right. be quite the, quite the sensation. Well, I... I can't disagree with you there. I don't know what the size of the Jewish community is in Des Moines or the size of the art house audience in general is in Des Moines, although I'm sure Des Moines is. I have never been to Des Moines, but I, as a man from Detroit, I would look askance at anyone saying too much about the Midwest. But, yeah, I mean, I think this is what, what's known as a limited theatrical release. Yeah, yeah. This is not going to every multiplex in the country. Uh, very few documentaries do that. Probably Roger... Uh, uh, um, forget Michael Moore is one of the few who's who's able to do that. So yes, you're you're looking at a limited theatrical audience, but it's a it's a strong. I think the documentary film audience the the um, is a is a faithful audience, and they are looking for something that's that's interesting. That that's and particularly in the summer, people are looking for something other than the typical sort of Hollywood blockbuster. Mm. Can I ask what the budget for this film was? You can ask, and I can give you an estimate. Mm -hmm. um, because over the years, I raised money for it, so I don't even have a strict accounting. But it was somewhere around a half a million dollars. Mm. Uh, not cheap. Not cheap by not any cheap. E right. even, even spread out over the years, it's still money. Yes, that's right. Um, now was, there, yeah. uh, was there material uh, that did not make the final cut that might show up in a DVD release? Because I assume you, you would do a DVD because, you know, good way to make back some more money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there'll definitely be a DVD release. Um, and there, you know, I haven't um, planned that yet. Obviously, it's a, it's in the future. But there is the possibility. There's a lot of there's a lot of wonder material, wonderful material out there. And and if I can, I would love to put it on the DVD. Hmm. And so, Joe, what's next for you? This is coming out. I'm sure this has got the focus of your attention uh, for the summer and the probably uh, early fall. But uh, what what are you working on now? What, what are you uh, working on a, a few projects. Um, I'm working on a project. Very interesting project about a man in in Newark, Dr. James Oleski, who was uh, one of the earliest AIDS pediatricians. He was really a pioneer. This is now the 30th anniversary of of the AIDS epidemic, and he was a pioneer. He was the first first man, or among the first people, who really discovered that that young children could get AIDS through transmission. But um, uh, Oleski continues to be. He's a remarkable, remarkable man and continues to be a pioneer. He works uh, in palliative care, pain management, and hospice care for children. That sounds like a dry subject, but it's something that's taboo in this country, and, and it sounds perhaps like a, a, a depressing subject, but he's such a remarkable man that I think uh, I'm convinced that the documentary on him can both shed light on what's going on in the medical profession and also bring to light this, this sort of remarkable humanitarian. Um, and then I've just received, along with the partner, Oren Radovsky, uh, money from National Endowment for the Humanities to do a history of the Zionist idea. Wow. And uh, Zionism is obviously continu continually controversial, maybe more controversial now than ever. Uh -huh. And what we wanted to do is make a film not just about the current political crisis or the state of Israel, but about what the idea behind Zionism is and its history its basis in 19th century nationalism and what, how it's been shaped and different variants of it over the years to give people who may not understand it a deeper idea of what, what, is, what, is, what it is behind the idea of, of the state of Israel and the idea of a nation for, for the Jewish people. So those, those are two uh, important films for me right now. It sounds like you will not be bored. I hope not to be. I hope <laughs> not. Well, folks... Uh 
You can catch a uh, film festival screening of uh, Shalom Aleichem, uh, Laughing in the Darkness, this summer in Toronto, San Francisco, and uh, Jerusalem. And July 8th at the... At the Lincoln Plaza Cinemas in New York, followed probably in the next two or three weeks by openings in Los Angeles, Boston, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Washington, and then uh, further parts of the country in the, in the months afterward. Very good. And uh, for the next closest showing to you, I suggest you visit the uh, official site for the documentary. It's uh, www.shalom. Shalom, shalom, <laughs> I'm doing it. Shalom Alechem, the movie. Com. Uh, That's correct. I'm not going to spell it. I'm going to assume that anyone watching this far into this interview can figure out how to spell it. Um, and you can uh, also support the film by liking it. Pardon me, by liking its uh, Facebook fan page. Yes, uh, exactly. Joseph Dorman, uh, fascinating to talk to you. Really interesting uh, film to watch. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Media, today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Bob. Our pleasure. And uh, folks, uh, for more original interviews with America's top documentary filmmakers. You can surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, you can subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many parts of the neighborhood shtetl. Show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. We're also supported by the PartyAuthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. If you've got an idea for a guest, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com. You can also call our 24-hour listener line at 1-727-498-4711 and leave a message. Some messages may be used in an upcoming show, and unless you live next door to me, there may be toll charges. You can also follow Mr. Media on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube video channel. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate you giving up a little piece of your day and spending it with Mr. Media. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye, everybody. <laughs>